This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and what a week it has been for SpaceX, NASA and JAXA with the successful launch of Crew-1 taking four astronauts to the International Space Station and setting a bunch of new milestones in the process. Starship development continues to progress with SN8 still waiting to fly and SN9 now very close to completion. Rocket Lab had their 16th launch, putting 30 small satellites into orbit as well as recovering the first stage. The European Space Agency launched a Vega rocket with a $373 million payload. Sadly, there was an unfortunate development during the mission, which we'll talk about as well. Then finally, Hayabusa 2's asteroid sample return part of the mission draws to an imminent conclusion, with Australia playing a role in the recovery operations. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Now, we'll cover all of the Starship news in a moment, but before that, we need to talk about Crew-1. This has been an incredibly amazing week for SpaceX, especially with this groundbreaking launch. Now, there is no doubt that 2020 has been a tough year for most of us, but this day right here was a wonderful celebration and distraction from the negative effects experienced throughout the year. I wasn't expecting to feel so overwhelmed yet again watching that countdown and the Crew-1 Falcon 9 lift off the pad. For a moment, it was like we were sitting there in that Crew Dragon with the team right there. You just have to give it up there for SpaceX and NASA. They can really put on quite the show. It is a truly epic example of how private companies and government space agencies can work together to more efficiently chart this territory, something that I think we can all be inspired by. In fact, a great number of people were, with millions of people tuning into SpaceX's and NASA's live streams. This new space industry is only just getting started, and this mission of course follows on from the success of the equally amazing Demo 2 mission on May 30th. This was the long-awaited first crewed mission of the commercial crew program launched from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. On board Crew Dragon Resilience here was NASA's mission commander Mike Hopkins, pilot Victor Glover and mission specialist Dr. Shannon Walker, and Japanese space agency Suichi Noguchi. After suiting up and a proud fist bump, it was time to prepare for the trip to the launch pad, but not before a quick visit from NASA's Chief Jim Bridenstine and SpaceX's President and Chief Operating Officer Gwen Shotwell. Time for a quick selfie there with the crew, then it was off to the transport waiting outside. The crew's families were waiting to share this incredible moment and wish them all a self-voyage to the International Space Station for an extended six-month mission. Interestingly, this will be the longest flight of a United States capsule since 1973 and Skylab 4 which remained aloft for 84 days. This mission also marks the first four-person capsule flight in the United States. So a 20-minute drive to the pad and time for the crew to head up to the 255-foot level just below the crew access arm. With pilot Victor Glover and Suichi Noguchi taking that quick irresistible glance upwards, they were off to join their crewmates. There was a slight delay once the hatch was sealed and a leak check identified an issue that was quickly resolved, but the countdown barely skipped a beat with safety protocols and procedures successfully completed. With the crew arm retraction initiated, the countdown continued without delay, and at T-0, Falcon 9 lifted off, sending the crew on their way, and a fully autonomous 27-hour trip to rendezvous with the International Space Station. During the coast phase, we were treated to a brief tour of the capsule, with Soichi there finding a creature in the storage area and joking that he stashed ice cream in one of the powered payload modules. Then Shannon Walker demonstrated how to drink from a bottle by giving it a twirl, which was quite interesting. In keeping with the tradition, Victor was also also presented with his gold pin for passing the 100 km altitude mark. So yes, 27 hours later and we saw a flawless soft capture with the International Space Station followed by crew ingress and the welcome ceremony before getting some sleep. So the crew are now hard at work beginning their long stay at the station. One interesting little fact is that this is the first time that there have been seven people together for an extended stay at the station. A lot of firsts here on this mission, so huge congratulations to SpaceX and NASA it is a massive achievement there. As tweeted out by SpaceX before the launch, Dragon is the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth, and is at the same time the first private spacecraft to take humans to the International Space Station. We can't wait to see many more.
Speaking of which, the brand new cargo version of Dragon is coming up sooner than many may realise. SpaceX's CRS-21 mission to the space station is currently scheduled to launch within the first week of December. That will be the very first autonomous resupply mission using the new Dragon, with the ability to autonomously dock to the International Space Station. Crew 1's resilience vessel was docked to the forward port of the Harmony module. CRS-21 will actually be docking here on PMA-3. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's going to be pretty sweet to see two Dragons docked to the International Space Station in a few weeks' time. I've had a number of comments talking about this on the channel over the last few days, so I'm not the only one excited to see that. Your support of the channel here continuously blows my mind, and it's people like yourself right there liking, commenting, and subscribing that allows us to cover it all so frequently. So thank you, thank you very much for the support here. Now, speaking of the International Space Station, a few days ago, Russian cosmonauts Sergei Rychikov and Sergei Kudsvechkov were out on a spacewalk preparing the docking compartment for the Nayuka module arrival and to mount the equipment on the outside surface of the space station. Quite a lengthy spacewalk too, taking 6 hours and 47 minutes, which was longer than expected. There was a hiccup replacing the flow control regulator, but most of the walk went to plan. You can check it all out from the link in the description. That is a pretty awesome view right there. Now over to Starship news for the week. Elon Musk revealed some information into the not so successful static fire that occurred last week. Around two seconds into the static fire, a fireproof coating on the concrete called Martite shattered, sending blades of hardened rock into the engine bay. As far as I've been able to tell, Martite is a ceramic field epoxy compound intended for use as some sort of form of thermal barrier. So that may protect from heat quite well, but perhaps not the devastating force of multiple Raptor engines and smashing it almost point blank. One particular shard of this debris severed an avionics cable, causing a bad shutdown on just one Raptor and the loss of vehicle pneumatics. SpaceX already has a fix for this, which will include covering wires with steel pipes and adding water-cooled steel pipes to the test pad. Prior to Elon Musk's comments on Twitter, workers already got to work quickly swapping out the damaged engine to ready SN8 for another static fire attempt. Early in the morning of the 14th, of November, Raptor SN32 was removed out of SN8's engine bay and was then taken to the build site ahead of its inspections as to what went wrong. From these pictures, however, it looks to be mostly intact with little to no signs of any visible damage. Then at 5.30am on the 16th, Raptor SN32's replacement being SN42 was driven to the launch site and it was installed soon after. Raptor SN46 was delivered this week as well, possibly for SN9 or another backup for SN8. Perhaps as a partial result of SN8's latest static fire, Elon Musk says that his Starship blog post will have to wait as SpaceX is maybe making some notable changes to the launch vehicle. Now this is an intriguing statement, so we'll report back on this as soon as we hear some more. Over to news at the build site, SN15's common dome sleeve was already spotted. That's right, SN15. How crazy is that? On top of that, SN12's forward dome was also sleeved and a new after dome was rolled out of the tents, presumably for SN13. Also early in the week, SN11's forward dome was sitting next to the mid bay and had its liquid oxygen downcomer installed. This downcomer feeds the liquid oxygen from the header tank in the tip of the nose to those Raptor engines. This forward dome was then stacked on top of the common dome soon after, which just leaves only two sections now until SN11's tank section is fully complete. Now updates with Starship serial number 9. Its nose cone which was sporting those aero covers was moved out of one of the tents and into the low bay. Then on Thursday its forward flaps were attached to the side of the nose cone. All that's left now is for the nose cone to be stacked on top of the nose cone barrel, completing the whole nose cone section, ready for mating with the tank section. SN9's tank section with those aft flaps installed was moved out of the high bay on Monday and was then picked up by a crane. Those six legs were then flipped out and SN9 was moved again and then placed onto the ground. It was once again picked up by the crane and was placed on those four self-propelled modular transporters that are joined together. Workers then moved SN9 around for a while, presumably testing the transporter out ahead of SN9's rollout to the pad. What is even more interesting is that those four SPMTs will presumably roll SN9 to the pad. The SN8 version only used two of them. Could this mean that SN9 will receive its nose cone at the build site 
and be rolled to the pad as a fully stacked starship? Let me know what you think in the comments. On the side of this beast is a collection of 73 thermal protection system tiles, as well as around a thousand mounting studs for possibly even more tiles. This is the most extensive that we've seen on a prototype to date. The thermal protection tiles are still being prototyped for a future starship that will re-enter the atmosphere at orbital velocity and in future even higher speeds. This beautiful animated video by Corey was released just a few days ago and you really want to go and check out the full version of this which includes the beautiful audio as well. That link is in the description so be sure to check that out. You can see here those heat shield tiles on the windward side of the starship take the bulk of the heat and pressures from re-entry as the vessel slows and most of that energy is reduced. Then comes the descent into the thicker parts of the atmosphere with those aero surfaces controlling the vessel all the way down to a pinpoint landing. Now we don't know what is going to occur in future tests or where the Starship prototypes may land for demonstration missions, but if a drone ship was used this would be quite a sight to see. Yet again, amazing work there Corey, there is more coming soon as well so make sure you are subscribed to show your support. RGV Aerial Photography posted this photo here of the massive high bay. When we zoom into this shot we can get a glimpse of what is happening inside. Super Heavy BN1 is growing fast with the first two sections already stacked. What looks to be the forward dome based on the reflections of the lighting is stacked on top of a four stack section which is possibly the section we saw called the fuel stack. Therefore this is the top of the booster making up we think half of the methane tank. The speculated status of Super Heavy BN1 can be seen in Brendan's diagrams here and that shows what sections have been spotted with their corresponding labels. And here is Brendan's weekly update diagram again showing the status of all starships and Super Heavy prototypes. There has also been an update with the human landing system mock-up with some sort of mock human habitation hardware spotted underneath the nose cone. Huge thank you to Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight picking up detail like this here. The quality of the photos really are incredible. RGV Aerial Photography also with these perspectives of SN8 there on the pad. Links to these incredible channels are in the description. Supporting on the YouTube channels helps them do what they do. So thank you for supporting all of us there. Now mission 16 for Rocket Lab dubbed Return to Sender launched from New Zealand with an incredible payload quantity of 30 small satellites destined for a sun synchronous orbit at an altitude of 500 kilometers for several rideshare customers. This mission also marked the first attempt to recover the first stage using a parachute and water landing. Of particular interest to Rocket Lab will be the teardown of the first stage after recovery. They want to learn as much as possible about the conditions the first stage returned in which will help with future designs and the goal of reusability. On top of all of this news, Ariane Space's mission VV-17 lifted off earlier this week. This four-stage Vega launch vehicle carried a Spanish Earth observation satellite and for France the first satellite to observe particular events at varied altitudes above thunderstorms. The launch seemed to go as planned but soon after there was an anomaly with the first burn of the Avum upper stage. Its role is to insert payloads into orbit and make adjustments according to the deployment criteria. But sadly, this anomaly resulted in the loss of both satellites totaling close to $373 million. After reviewing telemetry and other data, engineers quickly discovered that cables that led to the thrust vector controls were not connected in the correct order. This then resulted in the engine nozzle being moved in the wrong direction, causing that Avum upper stage to begin to tumble. That was quite a sad ending to this mission. So let's hope that a number of new processes will be introduced so that this can't happen again in the future. In just a few weeks now, Hayabusa 2's capsule containing the samples from the distant asteroid Ryugu will be released and dropped into Earth's upper atmosphere to drop down and hopefully be retrieved from the Woomera test range in South Australia. We'll talk about that more in a moment, but before that, a massive thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of award-winning documentaries. There is no other streaming service that contains the incredible science and space 
space-related content that we all love. Do you want to know more about asteroids and the potential possibility of life originating with them? Well, we very much enjoyed this documentary that follows the team behind the Japanese space probe Hayabusa 2 and its ongoing mission. The incredible goal sending this probe 300 million kilometers from Earth is mind-blowing. The probe, of course, touched the surface of asteroid Ryugu to pick up a sample which is due to return to Earth here in December, only a few weeks away. Also covered on Curiosity Stream is the episode Breakthrough, which lays out the incredible OSIRIS-REx mission. This is NASA's first asteroid sampling spacecraft on an asteroid called Bennu. The lead-up to the touch-and-go sample collection involved a series of maneuvers that needed execution before the pickup of that sample. Now, I've been a subscriber myself to Curiosity Stream for several years, and there is so much here to check out. You may also be interested in travel, history, science and technology, nature or food. It is all here and you can stream this incredible content worldwide on all of your devices anytime. If you would like to help support me and would like to satisfy your thirst for knowledge, give it a try by heading to curiositystream.com slash Marcus House. With that, you can sign up for access at just $14.99 for the entire year. You'll find that link in the description below. So over the last month or so, we've seen a lot of footage and excitement from the OSIRIS-REx mission retrieving its sample from asteroid Bennu. This has been extremely exciting, of course, and if you want to know more about that, check out my previous few videos. But it does once again bring to mind the equally incredible Hayabusa 2 asteroid sample return mission operated by Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency. In just a few weeks now, Hayabusa 2's capsule containing the samples from that distant asteroid Ryugu will be released and dropped into Earth's upper atmosphere. If that all goes well, that is going to be a very awesome day for JAXA as well as also Australia because the container will be parachuting, hopefully safely, onto the Woomera test range in South Australia. The date that this should happen is on December 6th, just a little over two weeks away from the published date of this video. We can see here from the official website just how close that we are now. This was captured at the time of editing, so if you head here now you'll be seeing something quite different. You can see there the trajectory correction maneuvers 3 and 4 are still yet to occur, which are simply tiny adjustments to ensure the trajectory is spot on for the vessel to release that capsule on target. Afterward, TCM-5 will send Hayabusa 2 into a flyby, allowing it to swing back out into space to visit yet another asteroid. This asteroid, designated 1998 KY-26, is known to be a much smaller body believed to be roughly 30 meters or 100 feet in diameter. It is also supposedly spinning quite quite quickly too, with a single rotation taking between 10 and 11 minutes. We are going to need to wait a while for images of this asteroid, however, because Hayabusa 2 will not be arriving there until sometime in 2031. This has been an incredibly rewarding journey, with the vessel reaching asteroid Ryugu in June of 2018 after having launched in December 2014 on the H-2A launch system by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Once the asteroid was reached, Hayabusa 2 spent around a year in exploration. This asteroid is around one kilometer in diameter and really appears quite similar to asteroid Bennu. Bennu, however, is a little over half the diameter, and Ryugu is quite a lot more massive at an estimated 450 50 billion kilograms versus Bennu's 78 billion kilograms. So yes, Hayabusa 2 left the asteroid in November 2019 after obtaining samples and completing a variety of experiments. We now wait very patiently to hear success as the capsule is returned to Earth. Very best of luck to JAXA and all involved. Now this coming week I'll be releasing a midweek video which is out of my normal video launch time. This Starship video we think is really beautiful, so I can't wait to see your thoughts on that. This is all possible thanks to the amazing patrons here. Creating more content on top of these weekly videos just wouldn't be possible without that support of everyone. That allows us to increase the time that we can spend and also allows me to get a little more help with the work as well. You are helping to support the entire team, so if you like what we're doing and would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. That gives you access to interact with us more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can have earlier access to the videos to watch before anyone else. And you can also have your name listed right here like all of these other incredible people. 
Huge thank you to Brendan, Adam and Brenton assisting greatly with video production and of course to the Quality Control Squad here for helping me research and proof the material for all of these videos. If you're interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video from last week covering the lead up to Crew 1 and Starship's wild static fires. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right content that YouTube has selected from a channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.